So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and on behalf of Professor Komsky, thank you for that very warm reception. Thanks very much for, for coming this afternoon. And, and particular thanks to um, Professor Tomsky. It is indescribably gratifying to be able to write a book and then attend an event to talk about it with the nation's bravest and, and most accomplished public intellectual and, and political activist. So I'm, I'm particularly grateful um, to Professor Chomsky for being here. I just want to begin by um, making a couple of points that I think will frame the discussion uh, that we're going to have nicely. And I'm not sure what that discussion will be because we haven't talked about it on purpose. Um, but there are a couple of points that I anticipate will help um, to highlight that I think um, I'd like to just briefly describe. So the book really makes the argument that the rule of law, as we have always understood it, has been radically degraded in a way that wasn't previously true. And the interesting thing about the rule of law is that it's a term that has a pretty clear um, meaning by consensus. It's not a particularly complex term. It essentially means nothing more than the fact that in a society we are all bound on equal terms by a common set of rules. And you can look to contemporary legal scholars who define it that way. Um, you can look, more interestingly, to uh, the 1980s and the 1990s when Western institutions like the IMF and the World Bank began demanding that lending country or uh, countries that received lending comported with the rule of law. And there were lots of lectures issued about what they were required to do in order to comport with the rule of law. And there was a seminal journal article by Thomas Carruthers in Foreign Affairs that warned that countries that don't live under the rule of law, in those countries, elites can use their superior financial power to co-opt political institutions. And that the critical requirement to live under the rule of law is that political and financial elites cease placing themselves above the rule of law and are subjected to it on equal terms to everyone else. And you go back to the founders, and as much as uh, disagreement as they had, what you continuously find um, is this emphasis, not ancillary or secondary, but really central, um, that the American founding, in order to be legitimate um, and just, had to venerate the rule of law. And this was true despite the fact that founders, almost across the board, um, believed in the inevitability and even desirability and virtue of vast levels of inequality in all sorts of realms. Um, and yet they continuously emphasized that the only way that that inequality would be legitimate and just is if everyone were equal before the law. Now, you know, anytime you make the argument or, or point out that the rule of law and equality before the law was important in the founding, you'll be met with the objection which is obviously an accurate one as far as it goes, so I don't think it goes very far, that the founders violently breached those principles in all sorts of ways, um, and that the country did as well, and that this concept of equality under law has never been um, the predominant uh, theme to describe American political reality. And although that is true, um, the reason I don't think it goes very far is because the important uh, part of that writing and, and, and that history is that that principle has always been affirmed as being central even at the time that we violated it radically. And the reason that's important is because if you affirm a principle and deviate from it in, in, in your actions, um, there's an obvious aspect to your behavior that is hypocritical. But if the affirmation is sincere and ringing and consistent, um, then those principles, even though you're not comporting with them, become aspirational. They become guides to what progress means, how it's understood, and how it's achieved. So even though the founders violated that principle in all sorts of ways, the fact that they continuously enshrined it and it was affirmed continuously throughout the next two centuries meant that most of the events that we consider to be progress in American history were driven by the reverence for this concept that we're all equal under the law, that equality under the law is how we determine if we're perfecting the union. And there's a real value in affirming principles even if they're not perfectly applied. And what I think is radically different about today um, is not that the rule of law suddenly is, is not being applied faithfully because that's always been true. What's different about today radically is that we no longer even bother to affirm that principle. We pay lip service to the phrase, the rule of law, but there's, in terms of the substance of what it requires, you can often, and I would say more often than not, in leading opinion-making elite circles, find an express renouncement or repudiation of that principle. So you begin with 
the Ford pardon of Nixon, continuing through the shielding of Iran-Contra criminals into the Obama administration's decision to shield all Bush crimes of torture and illegal warrantless eavesdropping, um, obstruction of justice, the aggressive attack on Iraq, um, the decision now not to prosecute Wall Street criminals for precipitating the 2008 crisis with systematic financial fraud. All of these acts entail very aggressive and explicit arguments that the most powerful political and financial elites in our society should not be and are not subject to the rule of law because it's too disruptive, it's too divisive, it's more important that we look forward, that we find ways to avoid repeating the problem. And so you really see constant arguments. Um, and you did, for example, during the debate over whether or not the telecom industry should be retroactively immunized for its role in the illegal eavesdropping program, that the rule of law is really not that important of a value any longer. Jerry Ford, when he addressed the nation and tried to convince it to accept the pardon, said, of course I believe in the rule of law, the idea that the law is no respecter of persons, but, and this was the amendment that was concocted for that episode, the law is also a respecter of reality. Meaning that if it's too dis disruptive or divisive, that it's actually in our common good, not the elite criminals, but in our common good to exempt the most powerful from the consequences of their criminal acts. And that has really become the template used in each of these instances. And that I think radically um, is different than how things were in the past. Uh, the, the other point I wanna make um, just to begin, and then I'll turn the floor over to Professor Chomsky, um, is that the other difference is that if we had a society that just decided that we were going to be very lenient and forgiving and merciful when people committed crimes, as I just described we do for elites. You could have debates about whether that was an advisable policy or approach to criminality, about whether or not that would be produce good results or not, but if it were applied, applied across the board, at the very least, it wouldn't implicate rule of law as huge. There are countries that take very lenient approaches to criminal justice. Um, and if we were a country that applied that same leniency to um, ordinary Americans as we apply to elites, th then there wouldn't be an issue with the rule of law. So for example, if you went and broke into someone's house and, 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 and bashed the owner in the head with, with a baseball bat and stole their valuable belongings and a week later or two months later got caught by the police and you said, look, officer, you got me. I did what you think I did. But isn't it more important that we could look to the future? Why, let's, why focus on the past? If that were something that worked for you or for people who sold drugs on street corners and the like, then um, there wouldn't be a rule of law issue. But the fact that that applies only to, um, to political and financial elites and not to ordinary Americans is the reason why there's a rule of law problem. At the very same time that we've created this template of elite immunity, we, over the past four decades, we have, in the name of law and order and tough on crime, built the world's largest and most sprawling prison state, one of its harshest and most merciless systems of punishment for ordinary Americans. And the irony that Richard Nixon um, was the one who received this pardon when in the 1960s he rejuvenated his political career by becoming the law and order candidate, following taking up the mantle of Barry Goldwater, running against the disruption and arrest of the 1960s, demanding harsh sentences, lesser parole, lesser opportunity for release from prison. Um, the drug war was really accelerated first under him. The fact that he built his political career based on this harsh law and order mentality and then suddenly when he got caught committing crimes was completely shielded from legal consequence is really the personification of this two-tier justice system that I'm writing about. And then of course the war on terror has brought all new tiers of justice where uh, people accused of terrorism, just accused, um, can have every right deprived from them, including the right to life, without any sort of legal rights or legal process of any kind. It's really a new class, a class where there's not even a pretense of due process. It's a persona non grata, a sub-person um, class where the government can do anything without any legal constraints at all. And it's this contrast between the shielding and immunity that we've vested in the elite class, or more accurately, that they've vested in themselves, versus the extraordinarily, unprecedentedly harsh and merciless punishment system imposed on everyone else that is the real menace to the rule of law and that I think is the most responsible factor for uh, the loss of faith in our political institutions and, and the widespread accurate belief 
that you see motivating the Occupy movement and other widespread citizen rage that our political institutions have lost all remnants of legitimacy and can no longer be used to effectuate change. So I think it's one of the most menacing problems and also one of the most consequential. So. Uh.